Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., where we're visiting with Dr. Harlan Ullman, uh, retired United States Navy uh, captain, uh, strategist, Fletcher School uh, graduate, uh, one-time instructor at the Naval War College, uh, swift boat commander during the Vietnam War, um, and uh, prolific uh, author and, and commentator. And you've got a new book, Anatomy of Failure, uh, which looks at um, the American military failure since the Second World War which is something that you and I have spent a lot of time talking about. You've spent a lot of time thinking about that uh, as you've looked at a whole series of organizational problems in the national security enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, as you and I have, have discussed, we do things the way we do them because we do them, not because they come with any form of intelligent design, sadly, too often. What motivated you to write this book, and what do you think the key takeaways, what do you hope are the key takeaways? Sure. First thing, Vago, um, it's not military failure. These are political and strategic failure. Quite frankly, the military has performed in most circumstances quite well, but sometimes they can't achieve the objectives that are set. Um, this book really started 52 years ago when I was preparing to go to Vietnam, and I was going to survival, escape, and evasion school at Warner Springs in the California mountains in the middle of winter, where frostbite was the issue. And I said to myself, the last time there was frostbite in Vietnam was during the Ice Age. What is going on? And so that led to a series of questions that I had continually answering myself, and I finally decided over the years that I was going to answer those questions. Uh, when you take a look at the record of American involvement in using military force, uh, since World War II, it's not been good. We did win the big ones, but those are wars we did not start, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, and certainly the first Gulf War, and indeed the intervention in 1989 in Panama. But the other wars, notably Vietnam, the second Iraq War, Libya 2011, and a series of other events such as Grenada and Beirut 1983, we either lost or we failed. And there were three overarching reasons why that is true. First, there is no school for presidents, as John Kennedy said. But our presidents, certainly the last four, were hugely inexperienced, unready, and unprepared for the job. And in their first year, all of them stumbled. Some stumbled worse than others. Second, they did not exercise good strategic judgment. There are a number of reasons for that, campaign provinces, uh, political slogans, expediency, ideology. Uh, John Kennedy came into office in 1961 wanting to outspend the Soviet Union because of the missile gap. Well, there was a missile gap, but we were the ones who were ahead. The Soviets were behind. George W. Bush wanted to change the geostrategic landscape of the greater Middle East. He did, but not the way he wanted. And finally, knowledge and understanding. We really lack sufficient knowledge of an understanding of places where we get involved. Before September 11th, nobody really knew the difference between Sunni and Shia. Vietnam was a classic, classic case of almost tragic comedy errors about how we didn't know much about the other side. So those are the three big factors. Now, how do we get around it? First, the fundamental problem in my mind, Vago, is the fact that our political system is broken today. Look at the tax bill. Um, nobody's read it. Uh, it's not very good. It's done on a partisan basis. The national security strategy has just come out. Uh, there are some huge problems with it because, quite frankly, the president is not going to abide by it. And so you may have a good strategy, but if the president doesn't listen, it's not very good. And what really concerns me most, not the Russians or the Chinese or the North Koreans or the Islamic State, they are not existential threats. What worries me most is that the U.S. military is headed towards a hollow force a force that's not ready and not prepared to be able to fight. And there are two overarching reasons for it. First, there's inherent, uncontrolled internal cost growth of about 5 to 7 percent a year for every system from people to pencils to precision weapons. And secondly, I have unbelievable admiration for the Pentagon because, quite frankly, the system under which they operate is so irrational it had to be designed by the KGB. <laughs> no rational person would do that. We've got continuing resolutions, we've got sequestration. The Pentagon probably spends 30% of its time on make work. And so how they are operating after 16 years of war is quite amazing. But the Navy collisions that took place are symptomatic of the 58 Army Brigade combat teams. Three are ready to fight tonight. The Air Force is 2,000 pilots short. You see all these gaps in readiness. So unless or until we decide that we've got to take a really strong action dealing with this mismatch between strategy, requirements, force levels, and budget, we are headed to a hollow force. I lived in the hollow force after Vietnam, and I'm doing my utmost to see that that does not happen again. But I'm afraid 
that to me is the greatest threat that we face right now. Um, you're a, a graduate in the United States Naval Academy, and you were also a, a destroyerman. Um, and I want to get to that uh, because I want to get your take because you, yeah. you raised it. But more specifically, um, there is no school for presidents, uh, but we had presidents that would reach out to very, very experienced people to solicit their advice, to try to shape their strategic thinking. We had big league strategists throughout history. We were talking about our uh, sure. mutual friend Brent Scowcroft and talking about, you know, that, that he was actually one of the, the strategists that other strategists study. Um, what are some, you know, and, and we also had strategists that were up on Capitol Hill in a very bipartisan manner who were always trying to drive the right outcomes for the country, even if it was not politically expedient. What are the things that can concretely be done, even at a voter's level from your standpoint, in order to start driving this change? Because you're right, the organism is not functioning correctly, and as a consequence, causing a whole series of other challenges on top of all the other challenges that we have yeah. that competitors and adversaries are imposing on us. In my book, Anatomy of Failure, Why America Loses Every War It Starts, I go through through a complete list of what can be done. Uh, quite frankly, we have a broken government, and repairing that is not going to happen overnight. And unless or until that gets fixed, we can only make superficial changes. But I have a series of recommendations. First, in the White House, we need in the National Security Council a red team that challenges all the assumptions that go into policy. For example, the president recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. All right, what were the assumptions? What were you trying to get out of it? Unless you challenge the assumptions, it's not going to work. I think in the Pentagon, we have to separate, and this is very controversial, the Joint Chiefs from the Service Chiefs. I think the Joint Chiefs should be there to provide strategic advice and have sufficient reflection. And because they are double-tasked with being a Service Chief with all the problems day to day, they don't have enough time to do that. In Congress, we need to establish the equivalent of a National Security Council with the senior members headed by the one person in government who has responsibilities both in the executive and the legislative branch, the Vice President, who's also President of the Senate. And the National Security Council of the Congress has got to meet with the President's National Security Council so that when we take off on a policy, we also land with the same policy. And that's very, very important. Thirdly, we need a revolution in military and education of our, of our people in government. I would argue that the National Defense University needs to be a national security university, but we have to focus on far greater knowledge and understanding so we get engaged in these issues. We have people who are real experts. Unfortunately, while we do a reasonable job in the Pentagon with education, there's a revolution that could be had. It's not going to cost any money, and it's going to really yield hugely important results. So those are three of the issues that I think need to be done. A fourth, you'll recall during World War II, Bletchley Park broke the codes, Purple, Enigma, so forth, along with the American code breakers. We need to do the same thing using open source media and open sources uh, as well as social media. At the Atlanta Council, where I am affiliated, uh, using uh, social media, uh, some of the young youngsters who were interns traced a Russian paratrooper from Vladivostok and Siberia all the way to Ukraine. There's so much material that's available, open source, we have to use that. And we have to make all of our people in government much more aware that the world is interconnected. Now, I argue for a brains-based approach to strategy. Colin Powell thinks it's somewhat arrogant. Some people think it's naive because everybody's going to use their brains. There are three parts of this that are really critical. First, we have to realize that the 21st century is different than the 20th century. We don't have the right tools. We're still relying on 20th century tools and doctrine like containment, like deterrence. You could detain or you could deter the Soviets, military force. How do you deter Vladimir Putin in active measures? With the best Army, Navy, and Air Force in the world, how do you fight enemies who don't have armies, navies, and air forces. So you need to understand that this world is different. Second, it has to be based on knowledge and understanding. And third, the focus of our policy must be to affect influence and control, will and perception. Whether you use military force or not, you want to get people to do what you want or to stop doing things that you don't want, and you have a variety of toolkits to do that. Unless we understand this is the approach we need, we're going to be behind the problem. And while the threats are not existential, we will be losing the opportunities here really to make America great and to ensure the prosperity and security that our citizens need. Um, part of uh, the discussion about educational, let, let, me, let me ask you, um, sure. before we get to education, I want to ask you about the force, because you mentioned something before we started speaking and you hinted at it, about the stresses um, that the, the sheer number of 
suicides and other issues that we're seeing. And you mentioned that even though you're of the Vietnam generation, that some of the problems that you're seeing and is seeing now are very different and in some cases actually worse than what we saw with the, with the Vietnam War. Why? And what is it that we need to be doing about that? Uh, because there are a lot of folks who say the force is simply not large enough. Uh, the same people were deploying over and over again. From your standpoint, what is it that's happened as a combat veteran? Well, first of all, being at war for 16 years just imposes huge, huge pressure on people and not winning. How do you define winning? Um, Iraq is a little bit more stable, perhaps Afghanistan, who knows? Maybe the Islamic State is, doesn't have a, a caliphate, but it's still alive and well. And so you have repeated pressure. Second, combat is not fighting the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of Midway. I mean, still a large percentage of our casualties come from uh, booby traps, improvised explosive devices. So the strain and pressure are such that you're under tremendous, uh, under tremendous difficulties, but you're never really facing an enemy. And over time, this really builds up. And because we have really overstretched our forces, for example, in the Navy, you have people standing one in three watches in port as well as at sea. All this really takes a huge, huge toll. And the point is, it's rather like somebody who smoked uh, 10 packs of cigarettes a day for 50 years. All of a sudden, the cumulative effects are not good. And what we're dealing with are the cumulative effects of 16 years at war, stressing the force under hugely difficult and demanding psychological conditions. And it's really a wonder that more people are not affected by post-traumatic uh, stress uh, syndrome. What do you think, but part of this is, the, the criticism made to the department is that it's been getting an enormous amount of resources. It gets the 554 billion, for example, or 550 or 545 or whatever the number is. And on top of that gets another $60 billion, for example, as a supplemental, which is, which is really budget. How much of this is the Pentagon's obligation, the Pentagon's responsibility to just spend those resources wisely, even if it includes changing um, what are very old school uh, readiness standards that may actually not be too terribly applicable to the world as it is? First, right now, given the size of the force and their requirements, we need a minimum of at least $800 billion a year. If we don't have that, the force is not going to be ready, it's not going to be modernized, et cetera, et cetera. Even the McCain-Thornberry budget of $700 billion, which is not going to be approved by the appropriations committees, is not enough. And so the Pentagon is really, really behind the power curve. And regardless of how efficient it could be, the fact is it's not getting enough money to meet the requirements with the force levels. And we're not going to be able to increase force levels simply because we're not going to have the money to do that. Uh, the new tax bill is going to raise the deficit by $1.5 trillion thereabouts. But additionally, over the next 10 years, we're going to accrue $10 trillion in deficits because of uncontrolled social programs and uh, things like that for Medicare, Social Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So putting more money in defense, unfortunately, is not going to work. What we have to do is to take a hugely tough look at our requirements. I think we have too many requirements. I think that when the combatant commanders come in, everybody says we've got to follow them. They've got to be cut back ruthlessly. In the book, I argue we can probably make do with a force of about 900,000 if we have the capacity to have deployed or deploy a joint force of 150,000 on each coast. It seems to me that's far, far more than enough. Second, we've got to rely on allies. The old Nixon doctrine of the early 70s, where we would provide the strategic stability, allies would do more. As the Canadian Mounties say in their unofficial motto, never send a man where you can send a bullet. We've got to be much smarter. Why we have to have ships or people deployed continuously in many places, we have to look at this far more imaginatively. We have technology in the form of drones. Uh, we're not very good in dealing with active measures. We've got to use psychological warfare. We've got to use PR. We've got to use all sorts of other things more cleverly. And it's very difficult to do anything like that in the Pentagon because the rules and regulations are odious. For example, I wanted to have a number of people in the Pentagon come to one of my book parties. And guess what I was told? The lawyers will not allow it. And so we've got to cut through this odious nonsense that prevents the Defense Department from doing things smartly, but we just have to cut back on our requirements and use other people, non-Americans, where we can. For example, the British military is imploding. The British are going to have two aircraft carriers. Why could we not send a squadron of aircraft to fill in for the Brits? And why could they not compensate to help us, similarly with the French or the Japanese, so forth and so on? So we've got to look at this in far more imaginative terms. Now, the dangers are not existential in my mind, but the military is headed towards a hollow force 
The service chiefs have been very brave. This is the first time in my lifetime that service chiefs have been saying Congress will be derelict if they don't pass a budget. I've never heard that before. But that's not enough. We're going to have a huge problem. People have got to address this seriously as the major threat to the Pentagon, or I can guarantee you there'll be some variant of a hollow force, and we're not going to be very happy about that. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, there's a big debate about the national security strategy, um, uh, that it says some of the right things, uh, but as you said, you know, it's undermined, as, as some of the critics have said, because of the behavior of the president or the statements yeah. that the president himself makes. Um, you and I travel very extensively, and it's fascinating how often the president comes up in a negative light in some of these yeah. conversations with foreign uh, leaders. It's very much on an off-the-record uh, basis. Do you think that that his statements, the concerns, his overall popularity, which is extremely low, um, Ronald Reagan had low popularity in Europe during the Cold War, but that was still in the afterglow of the Marshall Plan. There were still very positive feelings towards Americans, and Ronald Reagan had serious allies in Europe, whether in the form of Maggie Thatcher and Helmut Schmidt and others who, uh, so, you know, it wasn't just merely the American president who was trying to take a tough line. You had national leaders in these countries who were also willing to take a tough line on the Soviets. How do you see, you know, sort of the differences and the challenges today in assembling the kind of coalitions, because the national security strategy does say allies are required, but at the same time, almost every one of the nations that I've spoken to have felt alienated or, or, or you know, not as enthusiastic about working perhaps with the United States as we'd like them to be. Uh, my private conversations have not been as gentle as that. There has been a note of, of, of astonishment, and in some cases, outright fear. American influence abroad sadly is declining. The fact that we drew out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the climate change accords that were threatening NAFTA, that we weren't really hard enough on, on NATO in terms of stressing Article 5, all these things are seen as a withdrawal. And America first is seen as America is putting up the barriers. I think that there's huge fear and consternation among a number of our allies. Second, Vladimir Putin is running rings around us. I mean, you have to admire what Putin has done. With a handful of people in Syria, he's turned that around. We had hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq and Afghanistan, and those situations are by no means stable. Uh, Putin is visiting the Middle East. He's visiting Turkey. He's selling arms to the Saudis and everybody else. He's moving in. And by, by the way, I would not be surprised if he makes an initiative to try to resolve the North Korean issue. He and Dennis Rodman would be a great team in doing that. But the point is that American, American leadership and influence is really in huge decline. People are seriously worried. They see China and they see Russia as being relatively well managed, and they see America in a vacuum. And how do you fix that? I don't know. People say, well, we've got Jim Mattis, we've got H.R. McMaster, we've got John Kelly. But may I remind you that George W. Bush had Colin Powell, who was, in my mind, the military officer of, of a generation or more. And General Powell could not stop the Iraq War, which, in essence, he opposed the second time around. So Trump is going to do what Trump does. I don't think there are sufficient constraints. And quite frankly, I worry that American influence will decline. Is this existential? No. But at some stage, we're going to have to build ourselves back up, and that's going to be very difficult to do. Uh, let me take you uh, to the Navy question. Sure. Um, we've had a lot of uh, reviews. Admiral uh, Davidson uh, did a review. Uh, we had the CNOs, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, the latest one, the roughhead, uh, Michael Bayer, a mutual friend of ours who's the Defense Business Board chairman, uh, was involved. And Gary Roughhead, of course, former chief of Naval Operations, uh, did their um, SRR, the Strategic Readiness Review, and they looked back over the decades in, in terms of uh, the challenge. From your standpoint, what do you think of the reviews and what their findings have been? And the second is, you know, what, what's actually happening on a deck plate level that has to change that goes beyond just readiness funding, right? This isn't just a readiness question. First, this applies to all the services in different ways. The Navy is not unique. The other services have different problems that have not necessarily surfaced the same way. My concern is that we have lost track... <clears throat> too much in the military, and this is true in the Navy, of professionalism. You won't see professionalism in the Bear uh, Roughhead Report mentioned once. Um, I think the problems are that you have to approach uh, the military from what they're intended to do, and that's to fight in combat. For example, the Naval Academy, we don't graduate naval officers. We graduate ensigns and second lieutenants with bachelor's degrees. And then we send them out to the fleet, 
and we put lots of them in ships where they can't learn, they don't have enough time to do all the things that are necessary. And even when you go up the chain of command, I'm not sure that we really fully prepare our commanding officers for what the tasks are ahead. Uh, in my brief discussions with former skippers, cruisers, patrol boats, so forth, a destroyer today probably faces about 200 uh, administrative and inspections a year. That's absurd. And you know if you're a captain and you only get 190 right and the guy next door gets 191, you're going to be two of two. Ships don't do an operational readiness inspection or fighting drill, except when they go through refresher training. So we've got to put war fighting back in as a central training piece. But we have to understand this is part of education, and we've got to do it on the enlisted level and the officer exception level. The other point that's really quite invisible, and having served on the advisory board for Supreme Allied Commander for a dozen years and worked with four, we don't prepare our senior officers at flag rank. You get your fourth star, and away you go. How much time do you think any of those guys had to prepare for their new job? Zero. And so we've got to change the way that we prepare our senior officers once they get into grade. We've got to give them time off. You're going to have to change the law because you're limited to the number of flag and general officers. But you're sending somebody to be service chief or a combatant commander. They have to have two or three or four months to prepare, and that's what the British do very well. So my view is that the reports are very good. They focus on symptoms, but we have to deal with the causes, and I think we have to make even more fundamental, profound changes that have been recommended. Putting in the second fleet to deal with training, I mean, that's all well and good. But unless you go back and start from the very accession level for officers and enlisted and have certain principles, uh, and those principles are about how are you going to be professional, how are you going to deal with a whole range of challenges, and make that the number one priority instead of the 200 competing priorities that you have, some of which are not really priorities, but you don't have a choice. We've got to start from scratch. We can do that. When Bud Zomalt became CNO in 1970, his Project 60, he completely revitalized the Navy because he was fearful of the Soviet Navy and he was fearful of mutinies that were arising from Vietnam. We need a zero base start for all the services to see what our basic assumptions are and work from there. And unless we do that, because of the budget problems and because we are overstretching the force, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to make the changes, in my judgment, that are necessary. Um, you, uh, you were an exchange officer with the uh, Royal Navy. Uh, you were very, very proud of that. Uh, and um, do you think the Royal Navy gets it right, in a sense, because they have flag officer uh, sea training, FOST, which is a ruthless judge that they visit your ship. Uh, I know British commanding officers who uh, know that you know, driving of your ship is as important as fighting of your ships. Whereas occasionally from American commanding officers, I've heard, well, you know, the Europeans are better at parading their ships, but I dare them to fight their ship as well as I can fight it. You can't really fight if you can't even get your ship there without uh, getting hit by something, much less hitting anything. Do you think the navigation focus has been too weak? And also, what are the things that we can learn from the Brits? Because the FOST program is I think used by something like 35 other navies yeah. where the Brits actually are the warfighting judge of all, you know, a number of other navies. Well, I could spend three days answering that question. Um, We've got lots of tape. <laughs> We've got lots of, lots of card of all, space. When you take a look at the British accession system, uh, Dartmouth, which is their Royal Naval College, their Naval Academy, trains naval officers. You come with a degree. The similarly is the, is the case at, at, at Cranwell and um, at Sandhurst. Um, second, they're deadly serious. For example, when you go to a staff college or you go to the Royal College of Defense Studies, you are graded. And if you don't make it, you're not going to make flag officer. Uh, the submariners have something called perishers. Every prospective captain has got to go through perishers with a very experienced submariner who's called a teacher. And for the 100 years that it's been in place, 25% fail. We need a perishers course for the United States Navy, for the Marine Corps and everything else. When people go to command, before they get there, they have got to be stressed. And I think the British do far better in tactics and in how they really think about these things. In the Naval Academy, when we did navigation, we were taught to plot where we were. You take bearings, you draw the lines, and if the ship's going at 20 knots, you knew where you were 2,000 yards ago. British system to navigation is, is much simpler. You know exactly where you are. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting to go on the bridge of a Navy destroyer. You have to get a ticket to get on. If you go on board a bridge in a British ship, you have the captain, you've got the navigator, you've got the yeoman, you've got one or two other people. And it's much, much simpler and it, it's much more commonsensical. The organization in their ships are profoundly different because they got wet list and dry list. You're a line officer, that's basically what you do. 
Then you have technical people who run the machines, who run the weapon systems, who run the engineering plan. We need to look at that kind of wet list, dry list approach because you can't, in today's age, be able to do all things. So there are lots of areas that we can take away from the British. Uh, I think that would be very, very useful. The number one I would recommend is a parishers course for all commanding officers, in fact, of each of the services. Harlan, thanks very much. Really enjoy it as, as always. Have a great holiday, very happy new year, and looking forward to seeing you again next year. And buy the book, Anatomy of Failure, Why America Loses Every War It Starts. Uh, I was going to say that. Uh, every, every book you've ever written I've enjoyed. I know I'm going to enjoy this over the holidays, so that makes a great stocking stuffer for everybody out there. Thanks very much, Harlan. Happy holidays to you, too. Thank you, Marco.